Okay, we're going to look at problem 7.30. Uh, this is the two-dimensional problem so right here. Um, there we go. So it's, we're, it's a two-dimensional problem with an air fluid and so some function. And what we're trying to do is we want to create this figure to see what it looks like. We want to use a brute force method to approximate the answer, and then we want to use the FN search to really get a real more accurate answer. Okay, so how do we do this? So right off the bat, it says our x values are from minus 10 to 10, and our y values are from minus 0 to 20. Um, uh, I'm just looking through here to make sure there's not saying anything as far as using the number of things. Okay, so let's do this. So first off, we're going to clear everything out. Okay, so x is equal to lin space. I'm not a huge lin space fan, but there are definitely times to use it. This is one of those times to use it. From minus 10 to 10, and we're going to use 100 points. Just making that up. y is equal to lin space. From 0 to 20, we're going to also going to use 100 points. Actually, for what it's worth, I'm going to use, uh, say, 80 points. The reason being is that if you use the same number of points, if you make mistakes, there's certain mistakes that are common to be made with this problem. And if you make those mistakes, uh, it won't catch them uh, because of these square matrix. Okay. So, we're going to have, we need to mesh these together, right? So, x, y is equal to mesh grid of x, y. Again, what is that doing? It's creating a th thing so that you can have a x for, and if you look over here in this grid, it'll create a bunch of x points and a bunch of associated or corresponding y points that it can evaluate the function at every point. Because there's a whole bunch of times you have to evaluate this, right? And so, it's, don't try to put physical meaning to it, it's just giving MATLAB some numbers to do some crunching on. Here's our actual function. Uh, I'm curious if I copy that, what's going to happen? Um, yeah, let's not do that. Okay, so c is equal to at x comma y. I'm going to make an anonymous function. I could just go right off the bat and say z is equal to this, but I know I'm going to need the anonymous function a little bit. So 7.9 plus 0 0.13 times x uh, plus 0 0.21 times y minus 0 0.05 times x squared minus 0 0.016 times y squared minus 0 point, uh, 0.007 times x times y. Okay, now I know it's going to squawk at me at one point in time, so I can go ahead and do this right from the get-go. I can do the dot operators on here, which doesn't really change things, but it, it just makes it a little bit happier. Okay, so there's my z. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to count, sorry, that's my c, that's the actual Thing. I want to calculate my z value. So I'm going to z is equal to c of x and y. So you'll notice up here I did x and y, and then here I just renamed them as mesh grid because I don't really need to hold on to these values. I don't really care about those values. So it would be not unreasonable to say x1 and y1, but I'm just going to go x and y. But the point is, is that when I call this function, it's very much based on uh, the mesh grid values. I think that's it. Okay, now I need to create two plots. Okay, so how do I create two plots? I can do subplot, two, one, one. And the first one, it needs to be over here. So I'm going to try to create this surface plot, okay? So it's surf of Z, right? I'm going to run that. It's going to work. Okay, don't do that. Why not do that? Because look at the X values. X is going from 0 to 100. Y is going from 0 to 80. And we said right here, X is from minus 10 to 10 and 0 to 80. The reason is because it needs to be surf of x comma y comma z. So please be careful with that. Um, now, if I can run that, you're going to see that it's kind of ugly looking. It's kind of hard to see, right? Uh, what's going on? There's a bunch of lines. Well, that is because I'm going to set shading to interp in interp, um, and there we go. So that will look like what we expect. Lovely. Okay. Now. Um, That's interesting. The colors are different because the, the colors have changed. That's interesting. But the ranges are the same. So then we're going to create this plot. So we're going to come in here. We're going to say subplot 212. And we're going to do a contour. And I like contour F better. Contour F of X, Y, Z. And for this one, I do like the color bar because really without without having the match decoder ring over here to say what the different values mean, it's kind of worthless. And let's run that. So there we go. If I do shading and turf on that, does it have a difference? 
or I don't think it does. <coughs> See? Okay. So we don't need shading turf because the nature of contours it wants to hold one constant color between these things. Um, okay. So so there is our plot. Okay, lovely. So let's look at this. I'm actually gonna come here and make it so I can mess around with things. And what am I trying to do? I'm trying to find the maximum value of this curve. So you can kind of see it's here, right? So it's an X value of around one-ish and a Y value of around, uh, well, I don't know, is that six or seven, right? And the actual peak is gonna be a Z value or the, is gonna be around, so let me just do it. Around eight-ish, eight and a half, right? So again, the whole point of creating plots is so you can have a general sense of what our answer is going to be. So there we go. So what is the brute force? So down here we say use the brute force method to determine the approximate location. Well, what is the brute force method? Well, we just calculated a whole bunch of points, right? We calculated 100 points on the x, 80 points on the y. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to just simply say uh, max of z, right? So if we do a max of z, what is it going to return? It's going to return a whole bunch of stuff. Like, what the heck is that, right? Because what is max E? Remember, MATLAB is column dominant, so it will return the maximum value of each column. I don't want the maximum value of each column. I want the maximum value of the whole vector. And this is how we make it a whole vector. Okay, so now we run that. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we have the maximum value is 8.6, and that's about what we saw, right? Between 8 and 9. Uh, lovely, but not quite what we need yet because what we really need is we need to know where that happens. So how do you figure out? You say the max z and the index of the where it occurred is equal to max of z. Now, now we're cooking, right? So now we know it occurred at the 4,346 element of this z vector. Sure, that's lovely, but what, what do we do with that? Well, we can then therefore figure out our x associated with the max z is equal to x of index, right? And our y associated with the max z is equal to y of index. Now we know roughly what the x and y values. So our x value is about 0 0.909 and our y value is 6.32. And that is again what we expected, right? Because that's right around here. So we, when we zoomed in is around one. So it's like 0 0.909, fair enough. And value around six. So that passes the SNP test. Does that seem reasonable? Sure. Okay. What if we need more accuracy? We want we want it to be even more accurate. Well, we could do this. We can come in here and put a couple extra zeros in here. So this, so I am all about letting computers do work for you, right? This you're gonna find all of a sudden starts really slowing down. Because remember, by putting these zeros, this is no longer just a single vector, it's an array. Because that's what this mesh grid is doing, is combining these into a two-dimensional array and then calculating the z of that. So you will notice, my computer, I mean, it's not this awesome fast computer, but it's not super slow, and it just really slows it down to have to do this much hard work. I'm still waiting for the picture to come up. Where's my picture? Okay, I have my picture. That's kind of strange. So let's try to see how do it. Yeah. The moral of this story being is that this is too much stuff. This is a lot of work and it's really bogging down the system. So given that that's not what we want to do, okay, what can we do? Well, we have this cool little function called fmin search. So for what's worth it, it all of a sudden randomly this is going to start popping up uh, plots in the middle of There we go. It was, it was just too much. It couldn't handle it, right? So we want to use fmin search. So what does fmin search? fmin search has some rules. Okay, first off, it's the min. It's not the F max search, it's the min search. So how do I find the min when I when I'm really looking for the max? I find for where the maximum I find for where the minimum of the negative of the function occurs, right? So that's one thing you can do. The other thing is this follows different rules. You're only allowed to have a function of only one variable of x or y. It doesn't matter, but you don't get to have a function of x and y. So here's what I can do. I can say g is equal to at x and then I'm, so instead of retyping this, I could go through and retype this whole thing, and everywhere where there's an x, I could replace it with x1. Everywhere where there's a y, I could replace it with x2. Or I could say, you know what? 
I'm going to call C with x1 and x2. So when, when I call my G function, I'm going to turn around and call my C function, and the x variables that I pass the G function, I'm going to pass the first one to the first element of the C function, which is x. And I'm going to pass the next one to the second element of the C function, which is y. And since I'm doing this, I'm going to say, wait a second, I can just do that, because I'm going to need to find the actual minimum value, not the maximum value. So boom, put a negative on there, and I'm good to go. So now I need to do the actual fmin search. So how do I do fmin search? fmin search. Okay, how many inputs does fmin search want? Yeah, that's convenient. It wants two inputs. It wants the function and the initial guess. Okay, so what is my function? It's now g. And what is my initial guess? Well, I need to give it initial guess for the vector fmin search. So the first element of x, I need to give it an initial guess. So I could come in here and say it's between 0 and, say, 6. Or I could say, wait a second, I have a really good idea of what the answer is, because I just calculated it right here, okay? So instead, I'm going to put it in a bracket, I'm going to say x max z and y max z. So I'm giving it a vector with the initial guesses for every element of the x, and I'm giving it the function. And, boom, where's my MATLAB uh, window? It's going to return a vector answer. Okay, so it's, it's, and so what is this vector answer? Well, that is the x location, remember, in this x vector, so in other words, this is the x and this is the y, where this was a minimum. Okay, so I don't want just that, I want to actually know what the function value there is, so let's do this, let's say, uh, location max z comma so that's the location, so that's going to return this thing. And then the actual max z is equal to that. Now I'm doing this on purpose because it's going to give me the wrong answer. Now it's not the crazy wrong answer, but it's not the right answer. So there's different ways to do this. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do this. So let's remember, this is the minimum of the negative. So the actual, so x max true, I'll call it true. No, nah, it's not called true, let's call it... Uh, <coughs> is equal to location max z of 1. The y max true is equal to location max z of 2. Now here's where you have all sorts of different ways to do this. I can say the max z true is equal to the absolute value of max z true. But that's not such a great idea. So I can say really more accurate is minus max z. I could also say max z true 2 is equal to, I put the semicolons, the whole point of this is to display this, sorry. Max z 2 is, I can just evaluate my function, c of x max true, I'm going to y max true. Which one is the more appropriate thing to do? I don't know. It's going to give me the same answer, right? So I'm going to come in here and my x max and my y max, and how I calculate it, I don't know. But it, absolute value is not the right thing. I, I'm realizing as I wrote that, it's definitely not the right thing, because you might, your minimum value might still be a positive number, your max is not the negative of that. So, or it's, it's not the absolute value of that, it's the negative of this. Okay. So that is that. That really is, that, that's the whole problem right there. It's, a, it's not too overwhelming. Just highlights, you create your x and y vectors, mesh them together. You have to do that. This you have to do in order to do this. It's just kind of a necessary evil to do this. I am going to calculate my z vectors. I could have, so just for the record, I could have come in here and done this. I could have said z is equal to that, right? You buy that. That, that, could, have, that could have happened. It would give me the right answers. I, I don't do that, and it's not because it's the answers are going to be wrong. It's because I learned from personal experience that if I have this equation, typed more than one time, inevitably something's going to change and someone's going to screw something up. So you're going to come back and a little bit later you're going to say, oh, that 05 is wrong, it's really supposed to be 04, and I change it here and I didn't change it there, and then everything goes out. So since I have this fairly complex equation right here, I'm just going to go ahead and put it in a function form and call it here. And then I create my subplots, create the figures, take, figure out what of all the data points that I've created where the max value occurred, right? Because that's what this is saying. 
is this is equal. These are all the ones that I created based on these inputs. Again, I can create more if I want to add more. Uh, oops, not like that. I could create less if I wanted to have, say, I want to do 30 and 20. Right? The picture's going to look a lot coarser. Well, okay, it looks kind of pretty because it's we're doing a, the shading and turf. Okay, let's turn off this for just a second. If you run that, you know, the, you, you have a coarser grid. Um, and so our, now our initial guess is not going to be as accurate. So our, whereas our initial guess is 0.5 and 6.2, and the real answer is, you know, 0.8537. But this will still work just fine because it is what it is. Okay. Oh, sorry, I was looking at this number and this number. I saw a difference, but that's not true. So there's, there we go, our x max and our y max, and the actual function evaluated out. So again, this is figuring out of the points that we actually created, where's our maximum value? And then we're going to use those points as our initial guess, because why not? We know that that's a reasonable initial guess, that's why we did it. And we're going to use that for our initial guess into this fmin search, which takes a function that's only a function of x, and it returns both where the, what vector this needs to have to have the maximum value, or the minimum value, and the actual value. And that is that.